All right. Welcome to uh, CS4510 uh, 2-1. I think this is the first part of second two. I may decide to split, split today's lecture into three parts. Not sure yet. But for certain, last time I said I was going to prove that rejects are equivalent uh, to regular languages. What do I really mean? So what I mean is like, if R is any, for all uh, rejects, uh, the language of the rejects, well, let me say it this way. Uh, there exists an NFA such that uh, the language of the rejects is equivalent to the language of the NFA. And similarly for, for the reverse, for all NFAs, there exists a rejects uh, such that the language of the NFA is equivalent to the language of the uh, rejects. So what that really gives us is it says that the languages of the rejects is then a subset of the language of the oops, language of the NFAs. And these are regular, by the way. Remember, that's the name for them. And then we also do uh, that the language of the NFAs are then a subset of the uh, language of the rejects. So this is just our proof uh, idea. And together, these two things combined will imply that rejects are equal to NFAs, right? In expressive power, they recognize the exact same languages, nothing more, nothing less. And this is just the proof style, so this has two parts. First, we're going to take every rejects and turn it into an NFA. And then we're going to take every NFA and turn it into a reject. So, uh, first recall what a rejects is. A rejects is, uh, a rejects, if you forgot, is uh, A, uh, for all A in uh, sigma, it is the empty string and it is the empty set. And then you can sort of recursively define it as a composition, excuse me, a concatenation, a union, and a, a clean star operator. Right, so what I'm going to do is make a DFA, describe how to make DFAs, excuse me, NFAs for these six things. And then I just say you compose them correctly and you'll get the thing. So these are our composition operators and these are our DFAs. So let's, let's say this first one, right? So I'll say A, all right, like this, I'll say A. What you do is uh, okay, that's an NFA for A, obviously. Right. Uh, then the next two, we have empty set and we have uh, uh, empty string. And the interface for these are just as easy as you can imagine. Right. So where, okay, that's an empty, that's an NFA for the language, uh, the empty set. Uh, excuse me, the, the set containing only the empty string. That's different than the empty set. This NFA accepts no strings. Therefore, it's the empty set, right? Let me write it like this, just to, to make it dear. Yeah, so a box holding a zero is different than a box holding nothing, right? There's some, there's some nuance between that, but uh, you know, it should be obvious why these are correct. Then these composition operators, we all defined them uh, in the last lecture. I spent a lot of time telling you how to do compositions, how to do unions, and how to do stars of uh, DFAs, right? The proofs I did of the closure was with these operations. So what you do is you just compose these repeatedly. So I'm going to say repeatedly compose these. And then you get uh, NFA. Simple. So let's do an example. Uh, let's say uh, 
let's make the let's say the language is uh, I'll just call it a one is equal to X is a string and X contains at least three uh, sequential uh, zeros. Right. So what is that rejects going to look like? We can have any amount of prefix and any amount of post postfix, including no prefix and no postfix, but somewhere in the middle there has to be three zeros. Right. So what the rejects is, is going to look like, I'm going to say R1 is going to look like uh, sigma star zero 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 sigma star so let's convert that to an nfa right so first thing actually if i were to write this correctly it would be zero union one star zero 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 uh zero union one star so let's let's convert that to an nfa so strategy here first i'm going to split this into three parts i'm going to first make an nfa for these three things and then i'm going to concatenate them and that should be good enough right so let's 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 go with the first part. Uh, let's do it in order. So I'm going to say this is the NFA for zero. This is the NFA for one, right? So this is zero, and this is one. Now, zero union one is then we just. Recall, I would go look at the last lecture if you don't recall this immediately. We just epsilon transition to an empty st an empty state. Now I could put the start symbol and the um, final states, but I will wait because I know I'm going to have to change them when I compose. So I'm just going to hold off on that. So this is for the uh, this is zero union one, but it's not zero union one star right zero union one star looks like we have another uh, empty state like that and then we have to do this if you recall there's like a little bug if we don't do that Oops. so this is a uh nfa for zero for a sigma star you might think well okay actually i can just make an nfa for uh, sigma star there you go how's that and you would be right but this is in the spirit of this algorithm i'm trying to prove correctness of the algorithm through an example so i'm not going to take shortcuts like this uh, i'm not going to take any shortcuts in fact i'm going to be dramatic about not taking shortcuts so now i need this middle portion three consecutive zeros but I'm going to do it using the composition, which implies there's an epsilon between it. So this is going to be A, epsilon, A, epsilon, A, right? So what that's going to look like is A, epsilon, oh, A, excuse me, zero, epsilon, zero, epsilon, zero now if i wanted just this as an nfa of course i would make this the start state and i would make this the uh this accepting state right um and this would this would be an nfa exactly for zero 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 right and now i have this dfa so i'm just going to copy uh this one so i think i should do it like this then Okay. Now, I need to do the concatenation between these. So obviously, these were supposed to be the final states, but they're, I didn't draw them, but you can imagine those were the final states. Then I'm going to just epsilon transition these correctly. This was supposed to be a final state, and this was supposed to be the start state, so I'm going to epsilon transition these correctly. Then, 
uh, we want the final states to be these remaining final states, right? So it was going to be, it was supposed to be these, and these were supposed to be left unchanged. Oh, and then of course our start state was supposed to be the start state of the, of the biggest one. So that is an NFA for a uh, if your string contains three zeros or not. Is that the smallest NFA? Obviously not. There's a lot of epsilons I could just start collapsing and getting rid of, and I, I, I'm going to you know, start mushing it together. But this is a correct. So this is, you could do this, I claim, for any uh, regular expression. This would be the methodology. Okay, so now let's prove the other direction, which is a lot harder so what we want to do is uh, convert any NFA to uh, rejects. And actually, because the NFAs or DFAs are equivalent, we're actually going to end up doing a DFA. Right? That should show the equivalence. So first we introduce we need to introduce another model of computation to use as an intermediary called a uh, GNFA. And I'm going to, instead of giving the full definition, I'm just going to say it's a modification of an NFA. G stands for generalized, so it's a generalized NFA. So normally in an NFA, you have, uh, let me write it like this. Um, I'll say that the, uh, the normal NFA way to do this is to have your transition function if you remember it takes a state and either an, a letter of the alphabet or the empty string those look too similar a letter of the alphabet or the empty string and it maps it to a new state here we just define our transitions to be uh, any regular expression go to new state uh, for any rejects are so uh why do we need these what we're going to do is collapse a we're going to convert an nfa and collapse it to a single transition using intermediary gnfas using a sequence of three rules so uh here's the first rule i'm gonna write it like this Uh, that's the first rule. Let's say this is the second rule, and let's say uh, this uh, is the third rule. Right. So what I'm going to say is, okay, if you have a structure internally, this is just a cutaway of some internal view of the DFA. If you have some structure like this, let's say that's let's say you have rejex one, rejex two, rejex three then you can imagine a, a string going through this and, and then the GFA accepts if there's any way to break the input so that you take the transition uh, with it eventually, right? It's non-deterministic by nature. So uh, this is equivalent as if you took R1, took as many R2s, including zero, as you wanted, and then took R3. So if we write that as a rejex, we can simply write it as R1, R2 star, R3, right? And let me let me make sure that this is a uh, transition in a GNFA to make things explicit. It can be quite messy when you keep these large strings on on uh, edges like this. So that's these are equivalent uh, sub pieces of a bigger GNFA, right? There's no final state or accepting state in this, which is why I say it like that. Um, sometimes when you collapse things, you might end up with a double transition and not realize it. So what that means is you just take the union. So if this is R1 and this is R2, you get R1 uh, union R2. And I'll, and I'll write the... All right, like that again. Uh, this is more common, though, when they're the same state, right? So I could have drawn this like... Uh, like, uh, like that and said so these are equivalent, right? So R1 comma R2, or even A comma B 
is equivalent to the the rejects R1 union R2, right? And finally, concatenation, right? So if we see uh, R1, then we see an R2. We just, we literally concatenate them. And then maybe there's some epsilon transitions you may manually uh, choose to compress in there, right? So then, uh, these are our, th I'm going to write these as three rules. One, two, three, right? Uh, what is our algorithm then to convert, um, the, to convert a GNA? First, we need to do some pre-processing. So we say add a dummy start and end state with the appropriate epsilon transitions. And then two, while the number of states, so while the number of states is more than two, uh, apply uh, rules to uh, remove uh one state and then you are going to go down by one state usually each time so you're going to be left with two states so i'm going to then i'll say finally uh left with two states our rejects is on the only transition. So, uh, again, this is one of those things where the algorithm, I'm not, I'm not going to prove correctness. You can prove it by induction, I think. It's better done by example. So let's just do an example of an NFA. Let's actually do, let's do a DFA. So let's do a DFA if... Uh, Uh, it contains uh, one zero, right? So what that's going to look like is uh, I see as many ones as I want. As soon as I see a zero, at least one zero, excuse me, as soon as I see a single zero, I am accepting, right? That's a valid NFA. Excuse me, a valid DFA. So step one, I, I'm going to copy it with uh, some dummy start states. So put them like this just to make things interesting. And I'll say this is step one. So step one is we add these epsilon transitions in. This is now the start state. Uh, this is now an accept state. So first thing I'm going to do is I need to eliminate a state, right? So let's eliminate this state because that's like the first one, obviously. You're not going to eliminate the start or end state that we added in because that wouldn't make any sense. So I want to eliminate that one. So let me not draw it. And then I'll draw this one like here, I guess. And then this one like here. So uh, this is still a start state. This is now a new transition of the GNFA containing epsilon. So we're going to apply rule one here. R1, R2 star, R3. So we're going to have epsilon, one star, zero, right? But we can drop the epsilon. So this is just one star, uh, zero. All right. Then this state remains the same. We haven't talked about that one yet. And this one is going to be epsilon, right? So this is this is two. Now I want to eliminate this state. So what I need to do is first apply rule two. I'm actually going to do two steps at once. I'm going to apply rule two and then I'm going to apply rule three because it's fast. 
And what we end up with is the simple, uh, we end up with a single line like that. This is three. We're going to end up with uh, one star zero. So one star zero. Zero union one star, right? So we take this comma, put it to a union. Then we take, because it's on its own little thing, we say that's a, we say that as a, uh, a star, right? So apply rule one. So I'm going to say zero union one star. Then finally the epsilon. But we don't need to write the epsilon because it's implicit. It's fine. Anything concatenated with the empty string is going to be itself again. Right? It's like an identity element of a group. So then this is our DF, this is our, excuse me, our GNFA, uh, which implies that our regex is one star, zero, uh, zero union, one star. Now, you may have noticed I've taken a lazy way out again by choosing to simplify a DFA of two states. And you would be right because the rejects, this is called, I believe this is called Clean's algorithm. And the resulting rejects is exponential in length. Uh, compared to the initial uh, DFA. So I really don't want to write an exponentially, well, I don't want to write, you know, something that would grow a lot bigger than that uh, as a rejex with an example of three. There are more examples of this, though. But this should be obvious that, you know, given a DFA, I can sort of, uh, I can process it into a rejex with some work, but it's possible, you know. I don't care so much about the algorithms to, to go from one to the other exactly, but it is important to care that they are equal. Okay, uh, now let's talk about some uh, non-regular languages. First, the existence of non-regular language is not is not obvious, right? You have to think. Well, I gave you a, several models of computers. I gave you DFA's, NFA's, rejects, and then technically GNFA's. And I said, prove they're all equivalents. We didn't prove anything about the GNFA's, but you can should be obvious why those are equivalent, right? Um, but I haven't given you an example of a language which is not regular. So let me do that now. Here are some examples of languages which are not regular. Uh, 0 to the n, 1 to the n, for n is a positive integer. 2, um, something like a ww, where w is any string. So basically, can you copy a string, right? So like 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, right? And only the ones that are copies, right? Uh, and then sort of similarly to that one, W, W, R, where uh, W is any string, and W to the R is reverse of W. So like the, the mirror, you just swap the order of the uh, strings. Uh, English, sort of, quote unquote, is a, is a non-regular language. So there was a book by a guy named Noam Chomsky. He was, you know, a legendary linguist. He was at MIT for most of his career. And now he's at University of Arizona in his sort of retirement phase he's like uh 90 years old i think now he's also a very uh prominent political writer he's really famous you know if if uh he, if he was born in a different generation maybe he would have been a podcaster i guess he's one of those guys who writes you know a million books and apparently people listen to uh so he in his original research in ling linguistic theory he wrote a book called syntactic structures which is like one of the most famous monographs in anything it's very foundational 
And in the introduction, he gives a sort of informal proof about why English shouldn't be regular. And then he gives a formal proof later on. But I'm going to try and give you his argument about why English shouldn't be regular. Well, first of all, there do exist uh, subsets of English which are regular, right? So let's let's try and make one. So let's say um, something like... Something like that, right? Then I'll say, well, let's say, uh, we'll do like, you know, and these, he didn't call them DFAs either. He called them state grinet, uh, finite state processes or, you know, things like this. So I could, the sentence here would then be the man comes or the men uh, comes. Or the men come, right? So then in that case, this would be the accepting state and this would be the start state. And the way you read a sentence then is you just go in a directive flow. So the man comes or the men comes. The men come. So then this is now a DFA for a finite language, which is just two sentences. But I could say, you know, we can add an adjective like this. Old. The old men come. The old, old men come. The old, 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 old men come. Those are valid sentences. They're main, they may not be polite, but they're technically grammatically correct. And this, this is a study of grammar. So this is clearly a subset of uh, English, an infinite subset of English, but not every, not all of English can be contained in some sort of uh, finite process like this. So what he does is he comes up with a few examples. He says, let S-I... Uh, right, and so on. Well, I'll say it like this. Let S1, S2, right, so on be uh, declarative sentences. Then uh, the following are also sentences. We'll call them, uh, I'll say SI is a declarative sentence which says if SI excuse me, if S1, then S2. We'll say SJ is equal to either uh, S3 or S4. So in uh, this first sentence, then is not replaceable by the word or. It's not if S1 or S2. It's if S1, then S2. And there's a dependency among the sentences focused around the comma, right? So what he says then is then you can compose sent these sentences for no problem. We can say let SI, let S1 equal SI. And then we get uh, if, if S1, uh, then S2. Excuse me. Then then S2, right? This is a valid, uh, wait, let me think. Oh, then S2, S2, yeah, okay. This is a valid sentence, right? Um, sort of, if you say if, and then you sort of read it like that, then uh, S2, wait, ah, uh, Wait, no, yeah, then S2, okay, yes, okay, fine, we're done. Um, it's a valid sentence if you read it like this, right? It's hard to follow, necessarily, even if it may be grammatically correct. If, that you sort of, like, you can think of it like nested if statements. If, if S1, then S2, then S2, right? Um, but then he says, well, there's nothing stopping this sort of process. You can compose sentences with a dependency like this all the time, where you could have sentences like A, S1, B, uh, and repeatedly uh, compose sentences like this. And he claims that you would get a language similar to 0 to the n, 1 to the n. So if you were to compose this many times and then just drop the S1, you would get something similar to A to the n, S1, B to the n, right? And then he says, well, uh, this is sort of kind of like uh, this first one here. And the first one is not regular. Uh, I haven't told you why these aren't regular, but just assume that they are. I will prove that they aren't uh, today. Now, 
So this was the sort of argument, a very a simplified version of the argument that he gave, which is why English is not a regular language. I'm saying kind of with English because, you know, uh, these are, we're concerned, every finite language is regular, and we're sort of concerned with infinite languages and being regular and non-regular, but English is kind of a finite language, right? There's a bunch of books in the dictionary. I could write every possible sentence in English and then try and uh, structure them as a big DFA, but uh, that's not in the spirit of the problem that Chomsky was trying to study. He was trying to study, you know, the idea of English rather than what we literally have recorded as English. So now I'm going to talk about a proof technique about how you prove languages are not regular. Okay, now I'm going to show you two proof techniques to show a language is not regular. Here's the first one. It's called the pumping lemma. The comment has two M's. The idea is we assume to the contrary that there is a DFA with some number, some arbitrary number of states, and then we pump past it. We uh, say, no, these aren't enough states, we need more. But because it was an arbitrary number of states, there's never enough states for it to be a finite automata. So we're done. First, I want to draw your attention to something about regular languages, right? Uh, if L is infinite, then there exist strings of um, arbitrary length. If you take the opposite of that, if our strings were all bounded, if there was a string of max length, then we could bound the size of L by Great, uh, less than the size of the set of all strings of uh, that length or less. So we can sort of abuse this, right? So well, first, let me write it, let me write this out a little bit. Um, if uh, s is greater than p, uh, p the number of states, let me write it this way. Okay. So uh, if L is regular and uh, S is an L and uh, the length of s is greater than p uh, by pigeonhole some state is entered more than once. If our string has more than p symbols in it, and we have exactly p states, and because it's in L, that means this DFA accepted it. Sorry, uh, let me let me specify that p is uh, the number of states of of uh, some DFA for L. Um, what we can do is sort of abuse an internal structure of the DFA. This this is a proof technique which sort of relies on a very sort of neat trick involving the properties of the thing. So then I claim there is some uh, structure and some internal structure that looks like this. There is some prefix part 
here's our state that's been entered in once, uh, more than once. So then it goes off somewhere. It does something else. Who knows what it does? Let me just write it as a simple loop, right? And then there's some post uh, part. So what here? Each these are not transitions. Actually, let me write it this way. It'll be it'll be more obvious. <laughs> so there is something that happens beforehand, perhaps. Then we do something, we enter the state twice, we go on some number of states, who knows what we do, we go on an adventure, and then we come back to here, and then we go to here. So what that means is, uh, I break up S into X, uh, Y, and Z. So there exists X, uh, Y, comma, Z, and we break it up into in a special way such that this is what the internal structure of this DFA looks like then that should imply that for all i, uh, s, excuse me, x, y to the i, z is an L. Right? So what that means is x, z, x, y, z, x, y, y, z, and so on. These are all in L. Why? Because if you follow the path, if I go here and I go here and I go here, and this was an accepting state, and then I go here, I go here, I go here, I don't have to take this path. If I knew this was some internal structure, then I can just skip it. I can go here. So XZ should be an L. I can take the loop de loop twice. I can take this three times. I can take it an arbitrary number of times for it to be an L. Excuse me, for it to be an L. What that means is we can, this seems like a sort of useless and obvious fact, but we can flip it around and make it uh, a proof technique for non-regular languages, right? So I'm the bumping lemma confuses everyone. So I'm going to write it uh, in a very straightforward and a very strict manner. Step one, assume to the contrary L is regular. We are trying to prove that uh, we are trying to prove that a language is not regular, right? Second, choose S in L such that the size of S is greater than P, where and I'll say in the first step, and then so there exists, I'll say in the first step, actually, I'll go back. There exists a DFA uh, D such that a D has exactly P states, right? Some arbitrary value. We're just calling it P, and, and it's called the pumping length. Now, we choose the S such that uh, S is bigger than the P, so we can pump it. Now... Uh, consider all cases of breaking up S into X, Y, Z such that uh, each Y in each case is non-zero and X, Y as less than or equal to p. We need this by the pigeonhole principle, right? If you have this sort of loop has to be in the p plus 1 um, part, right? So for, for each case, find i such such that uh, x, y to the i, z is not in L. So we, we say this as we pump past, we pump past it, right? What's tricky about this is there's a, we get to 
it, we get to we get to choose the string, but then for all cases, we have to consider then there exists an i. So it's it's the the quantifiers people get people confused sometimes. So I wouldn't consider it. I would consider it only exactly as as this structure, right? Using this, I'm going to prove then that uh, a certain language is non-regular. So let's prove that first language is not regular. So let's say l is equal to 0 to the n, 1 to the n, such that n is any integer. Right? And I claim this language is non-regular. Right? So, uh, step 1, assume, I'll call this L1, assume L1 is regular, then there exists a DFA uh, with Q, excuse me, oh, P states. Now, the hardest part, not the hardest part, the most significant part of a pumping proof is choosing the correct P. Excuse me, choosing the correct string S. If, if you choose the right string S, you can make your proof incredibly short. You, can, you could just shortcut to the end. So, knowing that foresight, I'm going to choose this as my string. S is 0 to the P, 1 to the P. Clearly... S is greater than P, right? It's by definition. In fact, it's 2P. Now, what are the cases? Well, actually, because I noticed I chose this very particularly, so I wouldn't have any issues. The only case we have is that XY is only made of zeros. So what I'm going to say that X equal 0 to the A, Y equal 0 to the B, and Z equal 0 to the P minus A minus B, 1 to the P. So Z is just whatever's left over. But by definition, any other case where X and Y are not, X and Y cannot contain any ones. So basically, they're always going to be made of zeros, right? That makes things easier. Choose I equals 1. In fact, this is one of the cool ones because any I works. Okay. Actually, I won't choose one. I'll choose two. Yes, I can't. You cannot choose one, actually. <laughs> one is the one you can't choose. So I choose I equals two. Then what? Uh, and consider uh, then X, Y, Y, Z. By the pumping uh, lemma, this should be an L, but we're going to prove it's not. This is zero to the A. 0 to the B, 0 to the B, 0 to the P, minus A, minus B, 1 to the P, which is then equal to 0 to the P, plus B, 1 to the P. And because uh, since Y is greater than 0, uh, B is greater than 0, right? So B is not 0. B is 1 or more. Therefore, uh, this is clearly not an L, and uh, L1 is not regular. This, this proof could have been a lot worse if I uh, chose the wrong S. You know... There's a, let's say I chose um, something like uh, S equals uh, 0 to the P over 2, uh, 0 to, oh, excuse me, 1 to the P over 2. Then I might have to consider a case where Y has some 1s in it. And then, you know, I have to show if you still pump it, it, it does pump because you end up getting zeros in the 1 section. So you end up having a 1 before a 0, which would imply it's not an L. But it gets sort of more complicated, right? Sometimes for doing a pumping proof, you cannot avoid that. That's just necessary. That's just how it happens. But I have the philosophy of doing as little work as possible. So in that case, I choose the easiest string. Let's use this to prove two more languages are non-regular now. The, the, the two original ones I described. The two other ones.
All right, let's do a harder example now. Let's let's do um, L two is equal to W W uh, such that W is any word in sigma star. What this is is uh, just any word followed by a copy of it, right? So here's a bad string. Why is that bad? Because uh, if I pump a string of all zeros, I'm just going to get another string of all zeros, which probably won't violate the last step we need, where x, y to the i, z is not an L. So I don't have foresight on this one because actually I haven't done it ahead, but I think the string we want is going to be 0 to the p minus 1, uh, 1, 0 to the p minus 1, 1. Something like that, right? So uh, step 1, assume uh to the contrary l2 is uh regular let s equal that so i don't have to write it again so we have two cases i'll just say case one uh x equals uh uh, 0 to the a, y equals uh, 0 to the p minus 1 minus a, 1. And then z equals uh, 0 to the p minus 1, 1. Uh, case 2, x equals uh, 0 to the a, y equals 0 to the b, and uh, z equals uh, 0 to the p minus 1 minus a minus b. Uh, 1, 0 to the p minus 1, 1. You can see how this is getting, this can be a little messy sometimes, right? So now let's, let's do both cases. Case 1, um, choose i equals 2. Then we get uh, uh, 0 to the a, 0 to the p minus 1 minus a, 1, 0 to the p minus 1 minus a, 1, 0 to the p minus 1, 1. And this is going to be equal to, uh, there's an odd number of once, right? So this cannot be split into this form ww right the ones have to be in the w somewhere if they're both in the same w then one w is not equal to the other w so you can't split it like this that's how we explain the contradiction but i'm just going to write it out anyway so it's zero to the p minus one plus p uh zero to the p two p minus two uh minus a uh oh no excuse me excuse me 0 to the p minus 1, 1, 0 to the p minus 1 minus a, 1, 0 to the p minus 1, 1, right? So, again, with the argument with the ones. So that's a sort of, sort of a subtle notice. That's just something that you have to learn how to do in these pumping proofs is notice a detail like that. Like the fact that there's ones here and, and do it like that. So case 2. I am going to choose uh, I equals, I don't know, let's just make it funny. Let's make choose I equals 3. Then we have uh, X, Y, Y, Z is going to be equal to 0 to the A for this one, 0 to the 3B, 0 to the P minus 1 minus A minus B, 1, 0 to the p, minus 1, 1. It should be obvious now, if you split this all into uh, equal halves, the first half is only going to contain zeros, and the second half is going to contain two ones and the rest zeros. Therefore, this is not, uh, again, so this one is not an L. 
And this one is not an L. And actually, uh, something I forgot to justify here, uh, which you should justify, is that each y is greater than 0 and that each xy is uh, less than or equal to p. Right. So each here, here it's true that uh, each y is greater than 0, and it's also true that a and b, a plus b has to be less than p by definition because there's only p0, there's only p minus 1 zeros here. So the, the, they have to be less than or equal to p. Okay, let's move on to the last language I said I would prove is regular. I think we're calling it L3. It's equal to uh, WWR such that uh, W is uh, regular. And from here on out, we can assume that the exponentiating to an R means reverse of a string. Right? That's fair for you to use and for me to say, I think. So... Again, choosing S is the uh, most powerful step. There's a lot of things that can go wrong in this one. But I'm going to choose an S so I have as few cases as possible. So I'm going to choose S to be like 1 to the P, 0, 0, 1 to the P. Because if I choose a whole uh, a unary string, it's, it might be bad. So I'm going to say again, assume... To the contrary, uh, L3 is regular. And uh, let S equal uh, B in uh, L3. Clearly, it's an L3. Uh, you can split it in half, right? Now, we um, have really one case. So x uh, is equal then to 0 to the a, uh, y is equal to 0 to the b, uh, z is then equal to uh, uh, oh, excuse me, hold on, yeah, I'm jumping ahead, uh, 0 to the a. Uh, y is equal to 1 to the b, and then z is equal to the remainder, which is 1 to the p minus a minus b, 0, 0, 1 to the p, such that uh, subject, like, uh, subject to uh, a plus b is uh, less than or equal to p. Right. So z could have no zeros in it. Uh, and uh, B non-zero. But uh, A could be zero. So this definitely this certainly satisfies with these constraints that uh, X, Y is less than or equal to P and that uh, Y is uh, and Y is uh, greater than zero. Now I'm going to do something that's called pumping down, which, I mean, this one actually, it doesn't matter which one you choose, but I'm going to choose i equals zero. That when you choose i equals zero, it means pumping down. There are some proofs that are easier if you notice, wow, I can pump down. Uh, this It doesn't matter for this one, but I thought I would uh, just do it to mention it. So that gives us xz, which is equal to uh, 1 to the a, 1 to the p minus a minus b, 0, 0, 1 to the p, which is equal to 1 to the p minus b, 0, 0, 1 to the p, which obviously does not satisfy our conditions, right? Uh, w would have to contain uh, only 1s, and wr would contain the zeros or something, right? So, therefore, let me conclude, conclude, L3 cannot be regular. Okay.
I think that's everything for this first part of uh, this lecture. Next, I'm going to give you another proof technique, which can be easier but misused. Uh, it's more complicated. Um, I, if you're interested in this stuff, maybe not the pumping stuff, but in the grammar stuff, I would just sit down and read uh, Syntactic Structures by Noam Chomsky. It's a very short monograph. It's like 130 pages, 150 pages. It's very easy, and it's very foundational. A lot of people have said, yeah, this is the book that got me into my field. And uh, it's not my field, but it's it's a very interesting, you know, it's perspective about things, to be a well-read person. that's it, it shows up on the top 10 lists of all most important scientific books of the 20th century all the time. Anyway, okay, that's it for this section. I'll see you in the next section.